Hello, everyone. We are now starting our presentation from four class three GKN. We have Justin Swartz, Director of Strategic Business and Advanced Manufacturing Solution, talking of enabling industry 4.0 with 3D printing factories of the future. Justin Swartz is the Director of Strategic Business and Advanced Manufacturing Solutions, partners with customers from all industries to bring their products from 2D to 3D. After spending over a decade working in additive manufacturing for multi-billion dollar brands, Justin knows what truly drives the successful integration of 3D printing into the product development lifecycle and beyond. And it's not about chasing the latest 3D printing buzz, it's about putting use cases into business cases and successfully communicating that message. Justin has first-hand experience with SLA, FDM, Polyjet, MJF, SLS, DMLS, and ProJet at two different service providers. He worked as a lean manufacturing and design engineer at GE, additive manufacturing, disruption technology, subject matter expert at 3M. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. That's actually kind of an interesting blend of, uh, of details there, because I think it's actually a bio of Ken Burns, the person I'm, I'm actually replacing today, and myself. So. Yeah. My personal background is 12 years of manufacturing engineering experience at 3M with the last four years uh, dedicated to additive manufacturing. Uh, I joined Forecasts about a year ago uh, and have been looking at different ways to uh, approach you know, the strategic business side of things as well as the advanced manufacturing uh, solutions. So trying to find the technologies that make sense to scale up and the, uh, the most interesting part about where we are right now is that Forecast uh, was a 25-year-old company when I joined, and you can kind of see their history right there on the left. Uh, they they really focused on the, the urethane casting side of things and then uh, using 3D printing to support that technology with the major change coming in uh, 2016 with multi-jet fusion. Uh, with that major change, uh, the, the mindset went from that prototyping uh, aspect of things to more production. Um, and that's when this past year, uh, actually, as of January 2nd, uh, GKN purchased Forecast. Um, so GKN Additive, they've been focused on, on metals, uh, their history being high volume production for the automotive industry using their powdered metal solutions and centered parts. Uh, for automotive and then forecast uh, using this HP plastic technology as well as all their other uh, capabilities with F FDM, uh, urethane casting, SLA, et cetera, uh, kind of came together uh, with, a, with a different cus customer base and different experience uh, type. And we kind of saw this as the package of where we can go in the future. If we combine these two powers of manufacturing and prototyping, what solutions can we create to make that factory of the future for additive? Um, some of those things that we 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 value here and what we're, we're focused on is, is now the materials. Uh, we have access to, uh, you know, custom materials uh, on the metal side. We're creating solutions for DMLS and other printing solutions there. Uh, we have more engineering resources available, a lot of DFAM and engineering consulting opportunities. There's prototyping, you know, as we as we know it today, you know, the, the plastics as well as metals and all the custom finishes you can come up with, uh, including fast turnaround times. And then there's the, the more production focused side where it's how do we make one one part uh, turn into one million parts and using different technologies and finishing techniques. Uh, and then lastly, the most important part uh, for a lot of our customers is actually that we're certified and we're qualified to actually uh, make the materials for their products. Um, so we've been building, building up our capabilities, uh, getting qualified and certified for all, all the different applications, but we're also building out and scaling our, our locations. So right now we have a headquarters in Carlsbad, California for forecast. Uh, we're expanding out to Auburn Hills. Uh, but we also have a headquarters in Bonn, Germany. Uh, that's kind of the metal side of things. And then we have locations in, in China as well as uh, Italy. Um, so different opportunities 
we're scaling up both polymers and, and, and flat uh, metals, uh, trying to find, you know, uh, local partners uh, to keep things growing and then scaling up for global, global markets. So the, the real mind, mindset change here when you're building that factory in the future is, do you go with the standard 3D prototyping uh, experience where, you know, I, I, I always refer to it as the Amazon experience, where essentially you're getting the best part possible as fast as possible. So you get that instant quote, your order magically appears, uh, you know, you, you get your, uh, your receipt, and then next thing you know, it's printed and shipped to you. Well, what we're seeing is as the volumes go up, that manufacturing experience is uh, more of a requirement than it has been in the past. So a lot of what's trickling down in that prototyping experience is expected out of the manufacturing experience. But in reality, uh, in order to get that controlled repeatable process that you expect in manufacturing, there's a lot of alignment to customer spec specifications required. Uh, there's a whole lot of uh, engagement required up front uh, to understand the context of the application and what, what the targets are in terms of costs and schedules and all these other things. You build out a program plan, um, then you start executing. You know, Sometimes you, you just don't know what exactly it is uh, the technology can produce, but you come up with a plan, you do some feasibility studies, and then you adjust. Uh, with that adjustment cycle, you have the ability to then dial things into the point that you're qualified and you're, you're locking things down and then you can launch uh, uh, into production. So what do you do? Uh, I'm, I'm showing a variety of parts here right now. What do you do when all the customers expect is uh, this fantastic final part? A digital file is given and, and, and the goal is to replicate that perfectly. And it's really fun to uh, talk about you know, all the, all the different things you can print at one time, but at the same time, each print has its own requirements. And that creates a whole new level of, of complexity that isn't considered when you start going into manufacturing. So the, the key really is to start by setting the expectations. We all need to share and speak the same language. So, it, and it really starts with understanding the, uh, the process. Uh, here at Forecast 3D, we're uh, heavily invested into HP printing technology, you know, 4210s, 5210s, and color printing. Uh, so most of this conversation is based on that technology, but it can apply across to other, other technologies as well. Um, so really what it is, is in order to get that control and that repeatability, you have to look at the entire value stream. And it starts from the input where you're engaging the customer and developing that original plan all the way out to you know, how it's gonna be packaged in the, in the shipping container and what your expectations are for the, the customer feedback. And in reality, you know, the, the tagline here is additive manufacturing is more than just printing because printing is actually the simplest thing throughout this whole thing. Um, being able to dial in the cooling process, uh, do the uh, part unpacking and then, you know, blasting your parts, you know, getting them into their primary finishing mode, understanding the quality expectations of all the different parts that are within a build uh, are all very important. And then using all the information that's generated throughout this entire digital process to, you know, report on how well you're producing these parts, as well as how good are the parts and then using that information to feed it back in to continually improve this process. So when we start this uh, conversation with customers, typically uh, they have the mindset of, hey, this is what we deal with injection molding. Uh, there's a designing and iteration phase. There's a, a creating a tool phase. Uh, you kind of have a pretty good understanding of where your costs are gonna be. And as the part quantity goes up, the cost goes down. With additive, for some reason, uh, the thought process is, I gave a digital file, there are no costs to doing any of this upfront activity. Um, in reality, there's always costs. Uh, typically in, in the prototyping realm, the price is a little bit higher because there's a lot of time kind of doing this uh, designing and iteration phase. Um, as you start to get into higher volumes, uh, the cost can go down a little bit. Um, and you, you start optimizing some things, but you don't really get the benefit of 3D printing when you're taking this kind of uh, laissez-faire approach to, 
to uh, 3D printing. Um, next slide. Um, so this one is more specific to, if you go into this process with an understanding of how it works, you can actually design and iterate faster and cheaper than you ever could if you just went through the standard prototyping approach. A lot of this starts with having the conversations up front with your customer about what they're trying to do and understanding what's required. So within a build or two, you could potentially have something that's validated and the cost is much more manageable than if you went through the standard 3D printing uh, quote and get a part method. Um, a lot of times that's uh, because we're dialing things in specific to your application. Uh, and the more conversations you can have, the better that is. And really it starts with uh, striking a balance between all the objectives in your, in your program. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is that there's kind of a, a course correction of making sure you're choosing the right technology. Uh, if you're going to choose 3D printing. So if you understand the capability of that technology, you're, you're in the right ballpark. Uh, the next stage is uh, managing the engineering requirements and the project deliver deliverables. Uh, because once you're into the technology, you kind of know the materials, you know your, your capability, you know what these things are actually doing. Uh, it's then dialing in those fine features of what your product actually needs. And it really starts by asking all the right questions. You know, what are your goals? What is what is the, the timing, the target costs? You know, what experiments can we actually run to, to get the information we need to, to dial this stuff in? What are the uh, metrics and, and measurements that we need to take and the, the data that needs to be analyzed? How do we document and communicate it so that we can approve processes? And, uh, you know, any any other considerations, you know, the, the you know, how you prioritize the risk in certain parts, you know, control plans, you know, any, any kind of best practices, you know, go, no go gauges are always important. Those need to be upfront conversations in order to improve the, the overall uh, success and opportunity of a, of a factory in the future. So uh, when we're in the pre-process phase, it's all about starting out with that develop program plan, and then it's setting up the data the machine and then running the process and, and getting the feedback you need. Running that, that loop a few times around because in reality, you could run the same part uh, and get two completely different responses. So configuration one might be focused completely on cost, configuration two might be focused completely on quality or certain, certain aspects of quality there. Uh, and it's really important to understand the process itself because in the MGF process, there's a lot of thermal control involved. So there might be some, some risk here by going towards a lower cost part, uh, but it might be acceptable depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, same goes here. Maybe you don't, maybe you want higher quality things. So the cost might go up a little bit more and you get a better thermally managed process. So the real challenge here is not, not necessarily making the first build or the second build or the third build, because with one printer, you can do quite a bit. But what happens when you have to start doing millions of parts? When you go from one printer to two to three to as many as you need to scale up this process. Uh, considering the uh, material aspects of MJF, where there's you know recyclability in, included in this, there's different uh, different ways of processing parts. Uh, it becomes a real challenge to scale up, you know, on printer one, one part, uh, and then on, on printer two, a, a different part, and then try to interchange them between all these other systems and still keep everything moving. So at, at this point, uh, we're really asking the question, how do you create consistent uniform parts? Uh, how do you do it? Uh, how do you do the same product and part over and over uh, without it being too different uh, with variations in, in the different industries and their certifications and standards, you know, the expectation that, you know, there's a single part as well as a short run part and a, a long run part, you know, how do you dial all these things in? Uh, where, where do we land on all these, uh, you know, we're, we're producing thousands of parts. 
how much variation is actually acceptable. You know, you can kind of look at this picture and you can see some lighter parts next to some darker parts. Are those kind of variations acceptable? Um, asking these questions uh, up front when we're when we're dialing the process in so that expectations are actually set and we can uh, establish the right manufacturing controls uh, as well as dealing with the reality of is it the performance that matters or is it the, the manufacturing control specifications uh, because there's there's some some questions there um, the next next slide there's also what happens with all this data so once all these parts are produced what is the expectation for uh, the customer in terms of, you know, is the does the build number have to be uh, printed on this so there's some traceability? Uh, is there a certain quality yield actually uh, built into this process? And if there is, uh, what information can we collect in order to continually improve things? Uh, with the short run opportunities, you may not actually have, you might be able to collect a lot of data, but by the time you actually have something actionable, uh, the, the project is over. So there's some of these considerations that go on. Uh, other things to consider is long run, long run uh, opportunities. Uh, how do you set that up when you have 15 machines versus one machine uh, where there's a little bit more variation throughout the system? At the end of the day, your goal is to get the best quality possible and dial in, dial in your system. You can do these things. Uh, it's just understanding, again, up front, what what is uh, the, what are the requirements of the customer? And again, we're going to bring it all back to uh, understanding what this process is capable of, and it, it really starts out with this program planning uh, and walking step by step through this process with the customers and understanding what they need. Uh, depending on what the technology is you choose, you can get different responses. And my kind of closing out slide here is. When we're building this factory of the future, there's pretty much three things that are needed. I, I don't personally believe that there's technical challenges that we aren't capable of addressing. Most of them are actually based on how do we collaborate, how do we prepare, and how, how dedicated are we to this? And I shared a couple of quotes here, and I also shared an image in the background um, of actually our, our, our president of, of commercial and our vice president of commercial, and they're actually at format, form next right there. Um, and they're holding this medical device. Um, this medical device uh, is uh, a headset that required a lot of collaboration between the company, uh, CGX, and ourselves to produce properly. Uh, dialing in the color, the, the fit, the form of all these, all these little pieces, uh, as well as establishing you know, the, uh, an effective cost and, and you know, engineering functionality for it. Um, it took a lot of preparation to get our team to uh, have the processes in place to repeatedly do these things. Uh, it's okay to think that one or two printers are capable of, of doing this uh, repeatedly, but when you have you know, 45 people in your system, you have to make sure your, your documentation and training is accurate and uh, that you are uh, consistently and uh, continually upgrading uh, not only the technology around them, but as well, uh, the people as well. And then the last one is dedication. Uh, there's lots of opportunity to uh, fail, but at the same time, as, as long as you're moving forward, there's, there's good places worth going. Um, so that's kind of what I have for today. Uh, are there any questions? Hi, Justin. Um, so we have a few minutes left and we do have some questions in our Q&A. Um, so first one is, hi, Justin, how do you maintain repeatable part accuracy working with multiple HP 4 to 10 printers, especially if the same part is being printed on more than one machine? So that's, again, if, if there was any statement that I could repeat more, more than enough is give us the context up front of what your goals are. Uh, we can do some initial studies to make sure that we're hitting the, the tolerance and establish if it is a fit or not. Uh, so that's the feasibility portion. And if it is, it's a qualification. How do we uh, either set it up on a single printer or do we set it up on a, a controlled uh, setup or if the variation is acceptable within a certain range and your, your cost objectives are going a certain way, 
uh, managing the, the different prints and builds and materials uh, can, can just kind of fall into the standard production. Awesome. Um, another question from Christoph says, hi, Justin, how can scalability of the production site be achieved if even single AM machines are not reproducible? Um, sorry, ask that question again. It says, how can scalability of the production site be achieved if even single AM machines are not reproducible? So single uh, AM machines are actually reproducible within a range. It's just understanding that range and where it fits into your potential product. Um, so we have various, uh, we'll call it opportunities here, um, where customers are actually challenging us on the, on the finest features they can achieve and making sure within an entire assembly that these features are repeatable uh, down to the point that you can feel the, uh, the friction in some of these kind of button applications uh, for like a commercial electronics. Uh, so it's having that feedback, uh, being able to have consistent communication with a customer and building a team to support that is really the key. Um, it's, it's not all technology with additive manufacturing. Uh, I actually changed my my uh, boss's final slide because his focused on on people. Uh, people are actually the most important thing in this whole process because uh, as much as digital technology allows us to go faster, it still doesn't remove every constraint. We still have to qualify these processes. We still have to have people capable of understanding and, and uh, translating the information uh, so that we can execute on these things. Right. Um, one more question that has quite a few votes for. Um, how do you address the IQ, OQ, PQ challenge? Do you specify that only one machine can be used? Do you lock software revisions? How do you track material reuse? Here's, here's the interesting part. It is a continual learning process. So uh, as I said earlier, there was like a short run version, there's prototyping and then there's long run versions running into those long run versions of, of products, most of them don't require that level of, of consistency uh, in terms of nailing down every aspect where you're, you're doing that. Uh, medical is obviously one area uh, that has the opportunity to do that. And we're actually working on applications uh, right now uh, where we're, we are going to lock down printers for a given recipe and build reports will be designated based on that. So it's just like any standard manufacturing process. Once you get those applications that you can run a machine and dedicate it to that, that format, it's happening. Uh, otherwise, uh, most, most applications we're finding are, are really driven by cost timelines uh, and, and other uh, program features uh, that fit within standard production means. So they aren't required yet. Awesome. Um, another question. How do you manage the identification if you have a high mix of models in your printed batch? Uh, a high mix of models. So it's an interesting problem. Uh, there's different ways to handle it. If they're obviously different parts, that's one clear way of separating them. The other one is if they're uh, slight variations of each other, you can actually mark the parts or there's some fixturing you can do in terms of uh, you know caging them. So if it's a bunch of small little components, you can uh, build a cage around it. So 3D print its own box inside, inside the printer. So there's all sorts of ways of uh, approaching it. it, kind of depends on the technology they're using. Awesome, thank you. Um, I think we'll end on this question for the session being being the first ones to experience HP's metal jet technology, what is your take on the machines? Are the parts produced comparable to LPBF in terms of density and GDT? Uh, I'm not completely uh, knowledgeable on LBTF uh, technology, so I won't be able to speak on that part. Uh, clearly the metal jet uh, technology from HP is a huge opportunity and they're, they're dialing things in where forecast or forecast GKN, specifically more GKN, 
uh, is working is, is dialing in that centering process. So uh, we, we are quite confident in the printing process. It's dialing in that centering process to make sure the part design is meeting the expectations. So uh, really the, the goal there is without applications to develop, uh, it's hard to dial anything in. And again, all the upfront conversations have to have happen in order to enable that. Awesome, thank you. And I think we might have time for another question. Um, so one more, from your experience for metal 3D AM parts, does it make sense to prototype in plastic? Um, so I always approach uh, 3D printing as a crawl, walk, run scenario. Uh, if your first step is, is to print like the most expensive metal possible, uh, that's probably not a good idea. So plastic could be an alternative to kind of get that basic uh, step out of the way of, does this thing fit? Does it do what I think it, it should be doing? Uh, just the reality check. Um, otherwise, I would say, you know, stick, stick within the, the same technology class. Uh, it, it tends to have better results because then you understand uh, some of the side effects or, or consequences of choosing a technology or material. But plastic has its place uh, just kind of that initial kind of feasibility stage. Perfect. And we still have a little bit of time, so I'm going to keep asking questions. Um, another one that's got a lot of votes. Have you completed process level qualification with MJF, not part level? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I don't specifically have all the details on that one, but uh, we've been performing uh, PFMEAs as part of our uh, obligation to certain customers, and we're growing that out based on the applications that we receive. So depending on what uh, industry customers fall in, we typically follow their, their templates uh, to build out uh, the information they need. And these things exist out there, um, and we continue to improve them. Uh, depending on the applications we see. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Justin, for joining the conference um, and presenting as well. Um, we are now going to be going back into our virtual networking session for 15 minutes, and the next presentation will be at 12.15 a.m. EST. Thank you, everyone.